from the studios of Clean Fuels Alliance America, this is the Better, Cleaner, Now podcast. Authentic conversations with leaders in the biodiesel, renewable diesel, and sustainable aviation fuel industries. Now, here's your host, Scott Tremaine. And welcome. This week, Clean Fuels Alliance America's Director of State Governmental Affairs, Jeff Earl, sits down with Senior Advisor for Clean Fuels, Floyd Vergara. Floyd, good seeing you today. Thanks for hopping on the Better Cleaner Now podcast. Yeah, no, thanks. It's great to be back. Uh, great to be back talking to you, Jeff. Um, you're one of my favorite people, and uh, you know, with you leading the the state program, I you know, I would uh, highly suggest you change the motto to "Much Better, uh, Even Cleaner, and More Nower," <laughs> um, because I think that that fits. Uh, your your style and and what we all look forward to coming from from your leadership. Well, I appreciate that. I'll I'll take that up with the communications teams to let them know that we are going on another rebranding campaign. I'm sure they are are going to be <laughs> thrilled to uh, get all new swag, new posters in the podcast room, new everything. So I will make sure we get that going right away. Well. Thanks for hopping on today. So Floyd Vergara, the former director of state government affairs for Clean Fuels Alliance, uh, recently retired. Um, We'll see what that kind of looks like for him uh, today. But Floyd, how has retirement treated you so far? What what do you are you looking forward to in your retirement? Yeah, thanks for asking. I mean, uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out and hello to the Clean Fuels team and the of course, the um, the members of Clean Fuels who I really viewed as a second family for me. Um, so I, I miss everyone there. Uh, it was a fantastic experience working uh, the past four years at Clean Fuels as your predecessor. Um, but, you know, all good things must end. And after 37 years of working, uh, it was time for me to stop, smell the roses, uh, and get through my backlogged uh, honeydew list that I put out for 25 years. So I've had a wonderful first month of retirement, and I'm really looking forward to spending more time with my wife, Marlene, uh, my daughter, Misha, and my dad, uh, Bing, who turned 90 this year. Uh, As far as travel is concerned, you know, we're planning to travel to Japan and and the Philippines uh, sometime down the road. Uh, Both our families come from uh, Japan and the Philippines. That's great to hear. I know the career is, you know, that you have is very well uh, decorated with a lot of success, and so your retirement is very well earned. And I know we'll talk a little bit um, more about this uh, today, but you have um, semi-retired in some respects as you are still working for Clean Fuels in a special advisor role. But I want to get uh, maybe take the listeners back uh, a little bit further and and. There's these wild, crazy stories about Floyd Vergara wrestling snakes in the jungle. How does a kid wrestling snakes in the jungle make it into the clean fuels industry? (laughs) Um, So as I indicated, I'm originally from the Philippines. I I spent my first uh, six and a half years there. So the snake story that you alluded to, uh, you know, which is typically embellished a lot by clean fuels' very own Tom Vary. Um, actually is mostly true, believe it or not. I, I grew up in a poor village uh, south of Manila, and the main form of, of entertainment there for a group of young boys during the monsoon season was to wade into the river going past our village and tackle one of the many pythons that were um, swimming by. Now, you know, if you ask Tom Very, you know, these pythons were like 30 feet or upwards, but Realistically, you know, from a five-year-old boy, they, they look that way, but, you know, probably were no more than eight to ten feet long. But still, right? Uh, it's a wonder I, I actually survived childhood, but I did, and I eventually moved uh, to Southern California in the uh, early 70s. And then for college uh, in the late 80s, I moved to Northern California, where I got my bachelor's degree in chemical engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. And after working about a year at a local uh, refinery, um, got a job with the California Air Resources Board um, and worked my way up the ranks over the next uh, 32 years. Uh, In my spare time there, I'm kidding, but I I also got my law degree and practice as an attorney at CARB uh, as a side gig, uh, kind of my uh, stationary Uber gig there. 
Uh, after that, Shelby Neal at uh, National Biodiesel Board, my predecessor, uh, hired me as a state regulatory uh, affairs director, and I took over his role as director of state governmental affairs at Clean Fuels um, when he left to go to Darling Ingredients. So that's a, a, a short summary of my my uh, long time working in this field. So maybe there's a correlation between wrestling snakes and then working on state policy and leading state policy for clean fuels that maybe we can dive into another uh, episode someday. I'm sure there's a correlation there somewhere, but you mentioned your 30 years working for the California Air Resources, Air Resources Board. And during that time, you had a leading role in the implementation of the low carbon fuel standard, which has been a standard bearer in clean fuel policy on the state level has had huge impact on our industry. Talk about your role in leading this program. How did it all start? What was your role? Take us through that process. Sure. So I started in the effort to develop an LCFS program as a first line manager uh, right after I served as an attorney at CARB. Um, so at that time, uh, and there were two other sections that were working with my section. Um, shortly before then, the University of California at Berkeley, Davis, and Los Angeles had just completed a series of white papers uh, in 2007 that outlined and kind of fleshed out a groundbreaking concept called a low-carbon fuel standard for reducing the carbon intensity of transportation fuels. Um, based on those papers, uh, then-Governor Schwarzenegger signed an executive order directing CARB to develop and adopt an LCFS program by 2009 as one of the discrete early action measures under the recently adopted uh, California Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, uh, also known to many of your listeners simply as AB 32. So right out the gate, the LCFS was one of the mo you know first significant actions California took to begin to tackle climate change. Now, managing one of the three sections involved in the LCFS, um, in developing the LCFS, and with my legal background, I was actually charged specifically with developing the regulatory language in the original LCFS rule. Um, that was no easy task since we had no similar program to base the LCFS on. So if you look at the original regulation, uh, I'd say about 95% or so of the words in that regulation were written by me. Uh, and my my wrists are still uh, recovering from that process. Uh, at the same time, I would note, uh, many of your um, listeners may not know this, but at the same time, my section was also in charge of developing fuel specs and requirements on conventional and alternative fuels, which is how I first got exposed to um, what was then new and exciting fuels uh, called biodiesel, uh, there wasn't much renewable diesel to speak of at the at that time. Uh, and then through some great collaboration with stakeholders uh, of all sorts, um, both on the on both sides of the aisle, uh, including with NBB, Shelby Neal, Scott Fenwick, and Steve Howell, um, we were able to craft an LCFS that was truly innovative, performance and market-based and technology technology neutral, uh, which is the first of its kind in the US. That's that's great, Floyd, and and that policy has been replicated now in, in in other states, and you know it's something that the Northeast now is taking a, a you know a keen look at, and even here in the Midwest, we have several states now looking at California, Oregon, Washington, and their clean fuel programs and how they can uh, implement those in their state and make them. Um, more specific to their regions, obviously in the Midwest, agriculture is a, is a key piece of that. But during this, I mean, this is such a groundbreaking policy now that is, like I said, being um, replicated across the country. What were some of the learned experiences you think that CARP had through this? And what would they share with other states who are looking at this type of policy? And, and what would they do differently if they had a chance to do it again? Yeah, no, those are great questions. Um, easily could take up a, a whole separate podcast. Um, uh, just to just to step back a little bit, you know, in terms of the lessons learned, you need to understand those within a, you know a context. So when we started out developing the LCFS, we had a number of objectives in mind. Right, uh, first, of course, was reducing greenhouse gas emissions. 
But then there were some uh, key secondary objectives as well. Um, among them are improving air pollution levels, and by and large, alternative fuels are much better in reducing air pollution than their conventional fuel counterparts. Um, reducing the state's in, uh, dependence on fossil fuels, increasing consumer choices um, with additional uh, fuels, and increasing energy security, and then fostering a homegrown alternative fuels um, economy. So uh, biodiesel and renewable diesel were particularly important with respect to um, all of those objectives uh, since they basically check off all of those boxes. Um, in terms of learned experiences, I guess – the number one insight I could provide, uh, and I don't think a lot of uh, policymakers and regulators have really understood this lesson, is that regulators and policymakers, by and large, are not very good at picking winners. <laughs> uh, and that is a function of you know, lack of complete information about an industry or industries that are being regulated. Uh, the fuels that are produced. Um, you know, I can tell you from being on that side of the table, we know a lot at CARB, or we knew a lot at CARB, but we didn't know enough to, um, you know, to predict which fuels uh, would be um, winners and which ones would be losers in this uh, framework that we established within LCFS. We thought we knew, uh, and in fact, uh, if you look at the the record for the LCFS originally, most of the projections were looking at cellulosic ethanol and electricity as being the, the linchpins for the LCFS program. I mean, right off the bat, they were looking at uh, those two fuels as generating most of the credits, and then, you know, other sort of marginal fuels, or at least they were thought of as marginal, would bring up the, the rear. And of course... History shows that that didn't work out that way, right? Um, for various reasons, cellulosic ethanol didn't take off uh, beyond, you know, pilot uh, scale sort of production. Electricity, of course, has uh, taken uh, many years to get to where it's at, and it's mostly being used in the light duty sector. And this is where that important lesson um, uh, comes in. None of us at CARB. Uh, including myself, even though I was aware of all the benefits that biodiesel and renewable diesel could provide, um, none of us uh, thought that biodiesel and renewable diesel could uh, play the big role that it's playing now and it has has played. And, and we can talk about those numbers, but that's kind of the, the main lesson that I'd like to convey, not only to your listeners, but to any policymakers that may uh, hear this, is really just kind of take a step back, understand your deficiencies in knowing the industries that you're trying to um, regulate and trying to ask them to reduce carbon emissions and understand that they are in the best position to figure out how best to do that, you know. So the lesson learned is have a clear goal, establish clear rules, don't put your thumb on the scale and let the market and the industry figure out the best way to do that. Yeah, I think there's a key piece because as we talk about the LCFS and we talk about how it's a market-based program and you do have some, you know, probably regulators and other interest groups who are, you know, wanting to maybe, quote unquote, pick winners and losers. Um, one of the biggest pieces that we're always um, trying to convey to lawmakers and regulators who are looking at this is that uh, you know, technology neutral piece. And that's one thing that the LCFS was able to achieve. And as we know now today, sitting here, you and I, that biodiesel or renewable diesel have been by far some of the biggest um, pieces to that success of that program. And then that's why it is being replicated in, in, others, in other states and other regions. And so talk, Talk to me a little bit about that success of biodiesel. I know um, it has been, you know, just a huge piece in, in the carbon reductions, the credit generation, uh, removing, you know, trucks off off the road, that sort of thing. So what are some of those key highlights that we can talk about and let our members know this is what this program has allowed our industry to do and in, in the growth that we've seen from these policies and, and how biodiesel is going to continue to uh, probably – can continue to provide that success for these programs in other in other states. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, those are all uh, kind of the key points that, you know, I tried to convey when I was there. You're doing a great job doing that. Um, I know Steve Dodge, uh, your coworker, uh, is doing that as well on the East Coast. Um, but really, y- you know, like I said, we were expecting a CARB for cellulosics uh, and electricity to play a big role. And that didn't happen, at least not for elect- uh, cellulosic ethanol. And the way the LCFS is set up, you have – um, compliance curves or standards for both gasoline and diesel and their substitute fuels. And when you get credits uh, based on the carbon intensities of the fuels being below the standard, um, those credits uh, are fungible. So they can go from the gasoline side to the diesel sector or the diesel side to the gasoline sector. That's important to know because the gasoline sector in California, as it is in most states, is quite a bit larger than the um, the diesel sector in terms of the overall volumes. Uh, in California, there's about 14 billion gallons of gasoline uh, consumed each year, about three and a half billion gallons of diesel consumed uh, in the state. So gasoline by its nature, the gasoline side generates a lot more deficits, even though at least in the beginning of the program, ethanol was providing most of the credits uh, reductions in the gasoline side, but it wasn't enough. Uh, ethanol was improving in carbon intensity, but that reduction wasn't enough to completely offset the deficits that petroleum gasoline was was generating. So the biodiesel and renewable diesel on the diesel side of things were generating surplus reductions, not just to offset what was being generated on the diesel side, but they could be transferred and sold over to the, the folks on the gasoline side of things. So right. in terms of key roles, you know, beyond just the GHG reductions, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. I, I, let me just put this in stark ways. Without biodiesel and renewable diesel, the LCFS program would not have succeeded, uh, at least not in the sense that we're seeing now. Uh, it, it Frankly, it probably would have failed without the reductions that biodiesel and renewable diesel have provided. What are those reductions? Um, 45% of the carbon reductions and the credits in the the LCFS for the last six years or so have been from biodiesel and renewable diesel. Um, 42% overall since the start of the program in 2011. Uh, that, um, you know, it translates to a displacement of fossil diesel um, in last year, about 1.67 billion gallons. So again, keeping in mind that the total diesel fuel market in California is about 3.4, 3.5 billion gallons. That's almost half. So about 46% last year of the entire diesel fuel pool was made of biodiesel and renewable diesel. The picture moving forward is even brighter, right? So the first two quarters of this year, that um, percentage actually is closer to 60, if not 60% of the diesel pool is um, biodiesel and renewable diesel. So these clearly have played a major role in displacing um, fossil diesel. As you recall, one of the secondary objectives was defossilizing mm-hmm. the fuel pool in California. Uh, of course, it's generated you know millions of, of tons of carbon reductions uh, that are tangible. These are not relying on creative GHG accounting or regulators putting their thumbs on the scale. These are physical, um, cleaner physical fuels that are generating benefits within California. And that's an important thing that, um, you know, policymakers, not just on the West Coast, but everywhere that are considering an LCFS program, they need to understand the the sort of important uh, primary and secondary benefits that these fuels provide. That that is just some awesome numbers and figures to to think about and to see it on paper. You know, when CARB releases their their data, it, it's just it's great to see and shows the direction that we have. Big picture, do you see within the three point billion whatever billion gallon diesel market in California? Do you think one day you'll see every gallon either made up of biodiesel, renewable diesel? I, I don't doubt it. I do not doubt that. Um, That's great. You know, if, you know, this is just speaking for myself, um, looking at the projections and the analysis, I would say there is a very good 
chance and likelihood that California converts to a complete liquid uh, renewable diesel biodiesel blend you know by the 2030 time frame uh, we have certainly you know when I was in your role we pushed the California regulators to go in that direction you know they didn't think it was feasible uh, but actually the 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 numbers are trending in that direction uh, towards complete displacement of petroleum diesel uh, in a short amount of time. I know that'll make a lot of our members listening uh, here today uh, very happy. Um, you are listening to the Better Cleaner Now podcast. Uh, with us today is Floyd Vergar, former state governmental affairs director for Clean Fuels. Uh, we were just talking about the low carbon fuel standard uh, in California. Floyd, we talked a little bit earlier about this being a a key piece of policy that other states are starting to look at. Why do you think states like Minnesota, Illinois, New York, New Jersey are all looking to the LCFS and to something that they can enact in their states? What is driving those decisions? Well, I, I think there's like two simple answers there. The, the You know, uh, half of the states in the country have set for themselves very aggressive climate uh, targets. Uh, and in doing so, they either have to create entirely new programs out of whole cloth uh, to meet those targets, or they can look at what other uh, states have done to see if those programs uh, can meet the goals that they've set for themselves. Um, and success breeds, um, you know, envy and other success, and people want to imitate that. Um, that success. So uh, both Oregon and Washington uh, were heavily influenced by the California LCFS programs, and they established um, their own programs closely modeled uh, after the LCFS. And um, other states in the Midwest and um, East Coast are looking at those uh, successes on the West Coast uh, and seeing how can we apply these to help us meet the goals that we've set for ourselves. And, you know, this conversation is beyond, of course it includes uh, and must include greenhouse gas emissions, but this is beyond that. You know, these other states also have uh, other objectives they want to, they meet, right? And so um, biodiesel and renewable diesel are great at reducing particulate emissions. And so to the extent that these states have, uh, for example, disadvantaged communities and environmental justice uh, communities that they have to answer to, um, then, you know, uh, fuels like biodiesel and renewable diesel can help them meet those targets as well. And then there's there's a significant economic benefit to these fuels. Yeah, you, you brought up something that I, I definitely wanted to talk about, because I know while you were here, you helped um, start what we now refer to as the Trinity study. This is an analysis looking at some of these disadvantaged communities. How would biodiesel affect them in a positive way by removing that particular matter, making the air cleaner? What what went into your mindset? And first, thinking about the Trinity study, what was you what were you trying to hope? Was there or what were you trying to achieve? Was there a piece out there that when we were talking to regulators, talking to lawmakers, we can talk about the environmental benefits, but was there something that was missing to really drive that message home? And is that what the Trinity study was hoping to achieve? Yeah, no, thank you for asking that. Um, so th this goes back, and, and this kind of shows the, the the wisdom in bringing in, you know, somebody with extensive regulatory experience. Um, you know, when I worked in at CARB, I was exposed to a lot of different programs, and uh, some of those programs included air quality modeling as well as environmental justice uh, efforts. Uh, I led the Environmental Justice Advisory Committee for two years uh, there at CARB. And so that exposed me to a couple of things. One is the importance, the growing importance of environmental justice as a distinct issue that states are increasingly uh, needing to address. But also through my experience with air quality modeling and inventories, I, and then the, the work that I did, uh, my team and I did on quantifying the benefit, the air quality benefits of biodiesel and renewable diesel, it occurred to me as I moved over to National Biodiesel Board that um, there was a big hole in the literature and in stakeholders' understandings uh, and connecting the dots between you know, percentage reductions in PM and what that actually translates to 
in terms of what people, ordinary people, look at and decide to do on their day-to-day basis. And this is especially important for daily decisions in poor and disadvantaged communities. So, um, you know, I came up with a suggestion, a proposal to quantify the benefits of, um, you know, uh, substituting biodiesel for petroleum diesel in the highest diesel use sites uh, across the country. So these are ports, rail yards, uh, logistics facilities, and freight corridors, and also the heating uh, oil sector in on the East Coast. So we looked at uh, dozens of communities and sites uh, across the country on both coasts, uh, Midwest, uh, Mid-Atlantic, and so forth, Southwest. And um, we quantified those. Uh, we commissioned Trinity Consultants to do a study Simple question, what does the air look like in surrounding communities uh, if you substituted biodiesel, 100% biodiesel for 100% petroleum diesel in these sites? And the uh, results were astounding, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, thousands of uh, asthma cases reduced per year, um, you know, uh, many, many uh, uh, days, uh, work loss days prevented, redu- reduced, cancers reduced premature deaths avoided, so forth, all totaling um, $7.5 billion just for the transportation, you know, the the on-road transportation sector. Uh, And this is from the legacy vehicles that are still about half of the fleet out there. We've recently, um, you know, are completing the extension of that study, looking at marine and uh, rail uh, and aviation uh, facilities and um, those results are coming in, and they they look similarly impressive in terms of the benefits that can be achieved. Yeah, the the Trinity study. I know I've I've used it in almost every state that I've you know worked in, and the case that always comes to my mind was in Illinois, working with David Kubik and the Illinois Soybean Association. You know, we're in a Midwest state, but obviously Illinois, a uh, very progressive uh, lawmakers in in that chamber, and. Going to the suburban women lawmakers and showing them the asthma reductions and the cancer reductions really was a key piece for them understanding the positive of continuing to make biodiesel a priority in their state. And we could not have done that. And we, I mean, we can talk about it. We can talk about the cleaner air, but having the actual studies and showing them the data really drove the message home with them. And I know that's something that we will continue to use. I know Floyd and I have talked uh, another times we've talked about using that to um, translate into other languages to help further our communication and our uh, relationship building in some of these communities. And so I, that, that land, it is truly a landmark uh, study that is, is over time shown its benefits year in, year out. And it's, it's just a great, uh, foresight on your part to to plug that into our advocacy and in our communications here at Clean Fuels um, to to get that message out. I think it was just you know great great work on on your part and, and the folks at Trinity to put that together and it's something that's going to pay dividends on down the road. It, it, if I may, Jeff, let me let me add just one more point. So uh, what I'm trying to connect for your uh, listeners is. Programs like an LCFS drive volumes of biodiesel and renewable diesel and other alternative fuels. And then studies like the Trinity show the benefits beyond greenhouse gases of that increased deployment of these fuels. Um, But I want your listeners outside of California and the West Coast to understand that um, just because a state is interested in an LCFS doesn't mean they have to follow the California or the West Coast model of an LCFS. There's nothing inherently limiting about an LCFS that says you must do it this way and not that way, um, which is encouraging for me to see that uh, other um, regions are looking at um, you know their own regional specific type of LCFS, which I think... Uh, is an appropriate discussion to have in terms of finding ways to leverage the strengths of each region uh, and using that to enhance an LCFS program. So, uh, there, like I said, there's nothing about an LCFS that says you must do it the California way. And in fact, uh, you know, doing it 
for the Midwest, for example, to leverage the power of agriculture in that region, I think is a very appropriate uh, conversation to have. And you can certainly develop an LCFS that that makes use of that, um, the power of farmers to come up with, you know, great innovative solutions. Yeah, you mentioned uh, farmers, and then we can't have a, a podcast talking about state policy and you and I talking about what we deal with every day without talking about the role that agriculture has played in our industry. And obviously, me here in the Midwest, it's very easy to count on them um, as key stakeholders as we are trying to craft these policies that are going to adequately account for the role in the in the in the things that they are doing on their farms using uh, renewable fuels, no till, and things of that nature, water conservation practices. I mean, you know, I'm always amazed by the work that our farmers do every day and trying to be good stewards of the land. And I know. And I don't have to deal with it as much here in the Midwest, but obviously elsewhere, it's sometimes a foreign concept to them that, you know, that farmers are some of the best conservationists, whether it's land or water conservation or even air uh, quality. They, they need to have these lands working every year to continue to produce the, the feedstocks we need for our industry, but also the food that we eat. What what is your biggest takeaway working for Clean Fuels, uh, formerly National Biodiesel Board, with the, the the relationship we've had with agriculture? Where do you see that going? What have you learned most from the engagements we've had with our friends in the agricultural world? Yeah, um, I, I think you and I are on exactly uh, exactly the same page on this. And you know, one of the things that I have not seen uh, to date much, uh, but I. Th- I see trends uh, in that direction is the um, increased recognition of the importance of farming, sustainable farming practices. Um, And I really think the, you know, uh, the missed opportunity there from the policymaker standpoint is that, you know, farmers are are basically unsung heroes in the fight uh, to, you know, address climate change. And it's unfortunate that they don't get the, 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 amount of an extent of credit uh, from policymakers that they really deserve. I mean, for as you pointed out, you know, farmers, um, you know, had the foresight to put together a testing program to develop a fuel from feedstocks that were current, you know, at that time had very little value and were probably going to landfill generating methane and, and things like that. So it was the farmers that came up with the fuels that are now generating almost half of the credits in the LCFS program. They don't get the recognition that they deserve for that. Um, yep. You know, and I think there's an increasing recognition at states like California and other states that, um, you know, the the role of natural and working lands, including farmlands, to be both a carbon reduction strategy as well as a carbon sink to absorb carbon, uh, through the sort of uh, sustainable practices you mentioned earlier, no-till, decreased fertilizer use, and you know things like that, um, those are going to be increasingly important as the uh, the states have already addressed kind of the low-hanging fruits with respect to greenhouse gas reduction opportunities, and they're going to need to look at much more closely, pay attention to, and develop programs that incentivize and foster the sort of innovations that farmers have come up with, uh, as you said, just as a result of their being stewards of the farms that they have, you know, uh, tilled for generations. Um, you know, and I think I think regulators and policymakers don't fully understand. They, I think they have this vision of farmers as being um, sort of the J. Paul Gettys <laughs> of the farmlands, and really they're there to grow food and to be stewards and we need to find ways to leverage that. I think there is a gradual move towards that. Yeah. If you look at the uh, 2022 uh, scoping plan that CARB adopted, um, you know, a little while ago, uh, there is an explicit recognition of the important role that natural and working lands has to play in the future. So I think with that in mind, we're going to see a, a, a greater role for agriculture to play in the climate um, strategy. Yeah, they are definitely, as you said, unsung heroes. And the ones that sit on our board and have in the past and the ones that we get to interact with every day 
aren't looking for that recognition, but it's up to us to make sure that we are giving the recognitions that they do and, and showing regulators and policymakers the role that they have in the future, but also the, the role they've you know, played previously. And so it's on, you know, it's incumbent on us to, to do that. And I know it's something that the reason why I like to get up every day and come to work here at Clean Fuels is knowing that that's the industry I'm, I'm working for. And the people who are making this industry having are those farmers in the fields, you know, right now, you know, looking at what next year looks like, what, what can they, what can they do better? And so that's always, always a great feeling uh, to get up every day working uh, for them on their behalf. Yeah. Definitely. So, wanted to um, as we uh, you know continue to go here with uh, Floyd Vergara, uh, former Clean Fuels uh, Director of State Regulatory Affairs. Where do you see this industry going in the future? I, we we haven't really touched on it, but we've mainly focused on the transportation side of things and the policies that have led that. But we are starting to see an increase interest from other industries, marine, rail. We can talk about sustainable aviation fuel. Where do you see things going in the future? Yeah, no, great question. Um, I, I think, you know, a, as a recovering regulator myself, um, and, and, you know, those in those who are truly objective in the policymaking uh, space, I think they are coming to the reality of the limitations of um, single technology approaches, uh, in particular electrification of all things. I, I think there is a growing recognition, uh, hopefully there's a growing recognition that, you know, there are limits uh, to the use of a single fuel like that in applications where you can't afford to run out of fuel, uh, you know, electrifying an airplane, for example, uh, probably not going to happen in any of our lifetimes, if ever. I'm not getting on an electric airplane. <laughs> I'm not either. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the need to, the need for high energy, you know, liquid sort of fuels, um, those are things that are going to, uh, uh, get, you know, maintain the important roles of high energy, uh, dense liquid fuels like biodiesel and renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel in the years to come. So short answer, long answer to your, uh, short question is I see a continuing and important role for biodiesel and renewable diesel, not just in on-road transportation, but in those things that are the most difficult to electrify and decarbonize sectors. Um, and everybody knows that. And, and even the, I think the regulators are starting to understand marine, rail, aviation, and uh, to some degree the heating sector, especially in the poor communities, is going to be reliant on liquid fuels. The real question is how clean can those liquid fuels be and our fuels provide a simple answer to that question. Yeah, things definitely seem to be, you know, there's a lot of momentum out there for us and for this industry. And you can just see that, you know, from the, the corporate announcements that are coming from the Amazons and the Walmarts in the world and the work that we're doing with PepsiCo uh, is showing that there's just a, a, a bright future ahead uh, f uh, for the industry. And so as we sort of wrap up here today, Floyd, I wanted to give you maybe one last chance, any final thoughts um, on where we might be going in the next 10, 15, 20 years. I know you kind of covered that, but any other thoughts you have that you want to give us? You've had 30 years at CARB, a uh, number of years here at Clean Fuels. W what do you think You know, we're heading? Uh, I would say to your listeners, um, read beyond the headlines. You know, you'll see a lot of headlines talking about, you know, Tesla uh, semis coming into this and that and Amazon buying, you know, electric, um, you know, uh, delivery vans and things like that. Um, even CARB's own projections through 2045 show most of the fleet at that time frame, in that time frame, will be internal combustion engines. So uh, that tells you that the most aggressive regulatory agency in the world throwing putting billions of dollars into electrification, having uh, 200 highly paid technical staff working on the program, even they are projecting that, you know, electrification can only get you so far in very difficult to electrify sectors. So my, my advice to your listeners is listen to uh, Jeff and, you know, other folks and, and Kurt at Clean Fuels 
Um, we understand the nature of the discussions going on there and the where the trends are. Um, you know, uh, ask us or ask Jeff and those guys. Um, they will tell you that you know the headlines may tell a different story, uh, and that's a narrative that you know some stakeholders want to continue playing. Uh, but the reality on the ground is, you know, goods need to be moved, right? Food needs to be delivered, and most of that is going to be done. The vast majority of that is going to be done by ships, by airplanes, by trains, and by trucks, all of which need high energy um, liquid fuels to to deliver. So you're going to have a role. You're going to have a key role for many years to come. Well, thank you, Floyd. Um, it's been a great personal privilege uh, getting to know you and know, working uh, for you over my you know short time here at Clean Fuels. And on behalf of Clean Fuels and the industry, we just want to say thank you again for your career in this industry, the things that you have been able to achieve uh, on behalf of our members here at Clean Fuels. We just want to you know give you amount of gratitude that we can't even say in words, but just want to say thanks again for your incredible career and hope that you can one day fully retire and enjoy and take those trips and, and spend some time on that honey deal list. So we, we truly want to say thank, thank you on for all the work that you've done. I, I do want to say Jeff that, you know, um, you, you kind of embellished my accomplishments and stuff. Uh, and, and thank you for that. I appreciate that. I'm a good hype man. Uh, but <laughs> But, you know, for me, the honor and the privilege was just being able to work with fuels and an industry and members and team members like yourself that I, you know, truly believe in. Um, the The numbers are there. The science is there. Uh, those are things that I, as a lifelong environmentalist and Californian, can really get behind. So I don't look at things with rose-colored glasses. I see things the way they are. And to me, these are fuels that are providing immediate, real-world benefits, environmental, public health, and economic benefits that no other fuel can touch. So uh, I am happy to have ended my career uh, with clean fuels and to continue playing a role as a senior advisor to clean fuels because I think these are fuels that make the world better for my family your family, everyone. Uh, and and that's something we can all get behind. Well, thanks, Floyd. I think that's going to wrap it up uh, here today. We thank Floyd again for hopping on the Better, Cleaner Now podcast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this with a friend or colleague as we are going to have more exciting guests on in the future. Floyd, thanks for your time today. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for listening. Better, Cleaner Now is a production of Clean Fuels Alliance America. Follow us at cleanfuels.org and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. For more information on Clean Fuels Alliance America, visit us at cleanfuels.org.